All right, today we're going through Acts 19. Acts 19, we're going to see some of the uh, things that are going on here. We're going to take some lessons from them in Acts 19. So let's uh, start. So first we're going to see here in the first uh, couple of verses some unsaved disciples. Unsaved disciples. Uh, Acts 19, verse 1, it says here, And it came to pass that while Paulus was at Corinth, so this is now Paul traveling from you know, Corinth, we talked about uh, last time we looked at Acts 18. Now he's going into Ephesus, right? So, you know, Ephesus was like a vibrant, you know, city that he did a lot of work, like we see here in Acts 19. And he writes the letter in his epistles to the Ephesian church, which is very similar, if you didn't notice, to the, to the letter to the uh, Colossians as well. So if you didn't know, Ephesians and Colossians are often known as twin epistles because when you read them side by side, they touch on very similar topics. You know, two Gentile churches, probably uh, a lot of the same issues that he has to uh, address to each of the churches. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Right? So disciples are people that are following Jesus. But that doesn't always mean that everyone that's following Jesus is saved because here you have people that are trying to follow Jesus, they're disciples, but they are not actually saved. Isn't that a scary thought that people are actually wanting, they're making Jesus their Lord, they're trying to do everything that Christians do, they're living the Christian life, and yet they're not actually saved. And why are they not saved? Because they don't actually believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. And how many people do we meet like that out when we go soul winning? You know, these are often the people that you pray with and get saved on the spot because they're already in church. They already know about Jesus. They're already kind of trying to submit to Jesus's lifestyle. They already believe that the Bible is the word of God. And yet when you ask them, why are you going to heaven? They're like, well, I'm not sure. Well, I hope I'm a good person. You see, well, what was the problem here? Here, they hadn't even heard of the Holy Ghost. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. You see, so it's like Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 15, when you believe in vain. It's like you believe something, but are you believing the right thing? And here, there's people that are ignorantly following Jesus, trying to be disciples of Christ, and yet they're not even saved. Right? So, Sometimes people will, you know, give you a warning, you're not saved, based on your works. And you have to be aware of that, be wary of that, that it's not about whether you have works or not, right? Because if we were to judge these people, whether they had works, you would think, oh, maybe they are saved. They're showing that fruit, as people talk about. They're following Jesus. But no, the reason why they weren't saved is not because of their works. It was because of what they believed. They did not believe the right thing. And he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? Because he's saying, well, if you were baptized, right, and you, you know, your disciples, you, you knew about John, it's like, well, then who baptized? They said John's baptism. So he says, well, John's baptism obviously was representing the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So he's like saying, how can you not know about the Holy Ghost if you were baptized by John? Well, it's because a lot of, sometimes people just going through the motions, they get dragged along, they're in church, they, you know, I'm a Christian, a Christian background, my family was Christian, they, but they may not be saved, even though they're living the Christian life. So Paul says to them, then said Paul, John, he explains the baptism of John. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now this is a great verse to memorize. It's one of our memory verses, Acts 19.4, right? Because it gives us the clear definition of repentance in regards to salvation. There is a lot of confusion out there and there's a lot of false teaching out there on what repentance is. People say repentance for salvation is turning from your sins, right? And it's not, because if repentance for salvation was turning from your sins, that's just another way to say, keep the commandments to be saved, right? The way you turn from sins is you keep the commandments. So you can't say turn from sins in order to be saved, 
because you'd have to keep the commandments to be saved. It's very different to say you have to admit you're a sinner because admitting you're a sinner is acknowledging that you have sinned. Turning from those sins is stopping sinning, but the way you stop sinning is you have to keep the commandments. So there's a lot of confusion out there about what repentance is in regards to salvation, and it is not turning from your sins because that would be heresy. That would be work salvation. We can't tell people in order to be saved they have to keep works. Why? Because Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we know that Jesus and John and the disciples preached repentance. There's no, there's no question there. I mean, Matthew 3, 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus here in Mark, Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then we see here in Mark 6, even the, the apostles, when Jesus appointed them, sent them out to preach, they preached as well. And he, he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two, gave them power over unclean spirits. Let me skip down to verse 12, because there's a bit of what they did. And they went out and preached that men should repent. So then the question is, if John the Baptist is preaching repentance, Jesus is preaching repentance, the disciples, the early apostles are preaching repentance, what were they saying? Were they saying, give your life to Jesus, commit your life to Jesus, turn over a new leaf, turn from sin, stop sinning, turn or burn? Is that their message? Because that seems to be the message of all the preachers today that are mixed up on repentance. No, we don't have to guess what the message is because the message is told us in Acts 19.4. This is the message. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, what was the baptism of repentance? That they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Right, so the baptism of repentance was, as Acts 16, 30 and 31 tells us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right? So what are you repenting of in order to believe on Jesus Christ? Well, again, we don't have to guess. This is not about, you know, who makes the better argument. We just have to look at the Bible. The Bible defines what repentance is. Hebrews 6.1 Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from, what is it? Dead works and of faith toward God. So you see how it's the, the, the doctrine of repentance for salvation is not repentance from sin, right? It's the repentance from dead works. Now, dead works is not sin. Right? Some people say, well, that's sin there. No, no, no. Dead works is not sin. Dead works is works without faith. It's an interesting thing that the Bible is quite consistent because what's a dead faith? A dead faith is faith without works, right? Well, what's dead works? Dead works is works without faith, right? But what are we turning from? We're turning from these works, right, that people are trusting in order to get them to heaven. See, nobody's trusting sin to get them to heaven. Right? Right? We're not sinning in order to get ourselves to heaven. So that's why we're not turning from that to Jesus. But what's a substitute for Jesus as your saviour? Your righteousness. Right? So people are trusting their own righteousness, which is filthy rags, but they're dead works because they're not going to get you saved. That's why you believe on Jesus Christ. That's what you're turning from. And that's what makes salvation remain by grace and not by works. So this is why I think in Mark 1, it's phrased this way when Jesus goes out preaching repentance. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Look at this. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So you see that the repentance is the turning from unbelief to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So just be careful not to get mixed up in the wrong definition of repentance, that is preaching a work salvation, repenting of sin. Now, is repenting of sin a good thing? Of course. You know, it's something that you know, we, we should try to do as Christians as we live the Christian life, but it's not something we do to be saved. Okay? 
Now notice here in Acts, let's continue, Acts 19.5, it says here, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So here is where we get the practice, and we get the example here, that if somebody is quote-unquote baptized before they're saved, they need to actually get baptized, right? So, so some people, when they, you know, maybe they come from, you know, a religion that baptizes, quote-unquote, baptizes children, right, like the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Anglican Church, the Methodist Church, all these, you know, half-Catholic churches that are out there. They baptize children, right? But, they, but you, you don't baptize children because they're not believers, right? So same here. These people were not believers. So sometimes people get baptized, quote-unquote baptized, even as an adult. But as an adult, they weren't a believer yet. You know, maybe they, they went going to a church, maybe that was preaching a false gospel, or whatnot, it's not that baptism prior counted. Because if it did, let's say, you know, some people, they don't get baptized because they're like, oh, well, I was Catholic before, I was an Orthodox before, I was, I'm already baptized. No, you're not, right? You know, if you weren't saved before, you say, well, I got baptized before, but then I got saved, I'm already baptized. No, you're not. Because if that was the case, Paul would have just said, well, they're already baptized by John. Now that they know about the Holy Ghost, they're fine. No, after... They recognized that they weren't saved because they hadn't even heard of the Holy Ghost. They were baptized by John. He said, no, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. So Paul had the ability there to lay his hands on them, gave them gifts of the Holy Spirit after they were baptized with water, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here is where we, get, like I said, we get the example of people when they're not saved, they need to be rebaptized. So if you were quote unquote baptized as a child, you know, and you're not baptized after you've been, have been a believer, you're not yet baptized. If you were baptized quote unquote as an unbeliever, you're not yet baptized. So Acts 8, 36 to 37. This is where we see the Ethiopian eunuch. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So you see there what's stopping somebody from getting baptized? The, the Ethiopian asked eunuch, If you believe. And this is why you only get baptized once you believe. And baptism is only valid once you believe, as we see there in Acts 19. Now let's go on. Now we're going to see the sons of, uh, I believe that's pronounced Sceva, but I may be wrong. Sons of Sceva. Let's, let's continue. Acts 19, verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space. And, and I've mentioned this a few times through Acts, but every time I see these, these, uh, these time frames that Paul is preaching, to his unsaved Jewish brethren. Uh, you can see here the love that he has for his brethren, that even though he knows like, they're so difficult, they oppose, they, they persecute him, yet every time he goes to a new place, he still goes there disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Look, for the space of three months, you, see, you can see his patience and his love that he shows towards his Jewish brethren. But when diverse were hardened and believed not, so how long was it that he tried till he gave up? Three months. You know, so this, like I said, this is not a 10 minute conversation. It's not 30 minutes. It's not I spent two hours talking with this person and I'm done. You know, the, the patience that they had was a lot more, even with people that opposed and even wanted to, to hurt them at some, at some point. Spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So yeah, there is a point where it becomes not profitable anymore to just be arguing and all that sort of stuff. And we can see here that he separates off the Christians, going to the school of one Tyrannus. He's teaching daily for the space of two years. And, you know, he finds that he's being a lot more productive. So you can see there the love Paul has for his unsaved Jewish brethren. But at the same time, separating yourself from opposition allows you to be more productive. You know, and, and we have to, as soul winners and as ministers of God, we have to balance our time there because you can spend 
all day and night fighting with people, right? I mean, those of you who you know, jump on X, you know, it's not Twitter anymore, it's X. You know, you get on X, on Facebook or whatnot, you know, and you go back and you go back and forth forever, right? It's probably like Paul, going back, back and forth, back and forth, three months disputing. But you need to balance that with actually being productive with people that actually are listening and growing, just like Paul here. So he definitely spent more time, you know, with those open to the message, two years, rather than the three months, you know, still, but then that fight is still necessary, right? And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And praise God for that and the work that Paul was doing in Ephesus there in the school of one <laughs> Tyrannus, Tyrannus. Acts 19, 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul, by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So this is like at the height of like Paul's ministry. And this is why I believe, you know, as time goes on in the Bible and you see through the, epi in the epistles, you see these these powers that were given to the apostles start to fade. Because look at what's happening here in Acts 19. Paul is just able to have a handkerchief that's with him, go be sent to people that are sick, and the handkerchief that was from the body of Paul was healing people, right? But then why later on in his epistles, when he's, you know, in, in, in prison and things like that, he has people that are sick with him. You know, he's just telling Timothy, like, you know, do this, for your sickness and often infirmities. Where were all the people that had all the gifts of healing and things like that? And this is why I believe as God's word was being revealed, because that was the purpose that it was given, the, the, the gifts were starting to cease, right? And these gifts of the apostles that were given. So this is uh, this amazing thing that is happening here in Ephesus, where, you know, God, Paul is preaching the gospel, He's doing great miracles, healing people just by sending pieces of material out to them, and, and they're getting healed. But I think it's important to note here that the way that the Bible phrases it here, it says here, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, because it's still, at the end of the day, God performing that miracle. Now, one thing I want to note here is supernatural acts do not prove a person is of God. Right, that's what we've got to be, care, be wary of because even false prophets can do supernatural things. Right? Let's have a look here at Deuteronomy 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. So notice here, Deuteronomy 13 is dealing with false prophets, but the false prophets are doing signs and wonders that actually happen. So this is why you need to be aware out there that you know, it's, it's not that we base what we believe on people that do signs and wonders, because even false prophets can do signs and wonders, and this is why the Bible should always be the foundation of our beliefs, that the Word of God should be the foundation. He says, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So isn't that interesting that there, God allows false prophets out there to perform miracles, to perform the supernatural, and God is saying here, this is a test for you to see whether you love the Lord your God. Right? So we tie that into what we talked about last week, where we had Father, Word, Holy Spirit. God is the Word. The Word is to manifest. The way I see this, it's, it's kind of like a test to see, are you actually basing what you believe on God's Word? Or do you base what you believe on people that are performing miracles and then just following them blindly, not taking into account God's Word? What, what is the highest authority in your life? It says, Thou shalt not hearken unto that word of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him. 
keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he had spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. So some people believe that what happens in, you know, circles where they perform miracles and they're preaching a false gospel, maybe they're preaching another Jesus, maybe they're trying to say that they're Jesus. You know, there's all this stuff that goes on in the world. Is it all fake? Is it all trickery? Well, I, I don't think so. Because, you know, we see here that it is possible for people to perform signs and wonders and do the supernatural. We see here in Acts 19, the sons of Sceva, they were exorcists. But notice here, it sort of lines up with Matthew 7, 21 here. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And look at this, and in thy name have cast out devils. So this is what the sons of Sceva were trying to do. They were trying to cast out devils in the name of Jesus, but, you know, they, they, they were obviously just trying to add Jesus to their false practice. But these people, you know, they're doing things in Jesus' name, casting out devils in Jesus' name. In thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So supernatural acts don't prove a person is of God. So we need to be wary of that, right? Now the other thing is, let's continue here in our verse 13, Acts 19, 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, so a vagabond is just somebody that's sort of just traveling and has no certain dwelling place, exorcists, right? So these people were of Jewish origin, right? And they have like, you know, probably taken on these you know, pagan practices and whatnot. Now they want to add, they hear about Jesus, they want to add Jesus to what they're doing. So they're exorcists, they're casting out devils out of people, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus. So what do they call it? They're calling over them the name of the Lord Jesus, people that had evil spirits, if you don't understand what that sentence is saying. Took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preached. So obviously they're seeing Paul's miracles, they're seeing him do things in the name of Jesus. They're thinking, well, maybe we can just borrow this power. We're just like adding Jesus to the, their false practices. And some people have that mindset when it comes to religion. They just think, hey, well, Jesus seems like a good moral teacher. You know, let's just add him to our religion. You know, like the, like the Muslims will say, we believe in Jesus. The Buddhists say, well, we believe in Jesus too. Everyone says they believe in Jesus, but you can't just like add Jesus to your false beliefs and think that it's going to help you. Just like here, it didn't help them. Didn't, didn't cast, it actually got them into a lot of trouble, right? And same, if somebody's just adding Jesus to their false religion, that's not going to save them. They need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ completely. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? So we see here that they tried to use this power to exercise this evil spirit out of this person just got them into more trouble. And the evil spirit actually, through the man, attacks them. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So one thing I want to say here is, yes, supernatural acts do not prove a person is of God. But what we do see here is that the supernatural acts of God are always greater than the supernatural acts of the false prophets. Like they cannot mimic exactly what God does. Even though they might do something that is supernatural, it'll never match the things that God does. So God's miracles are still greater than those of false prophets. I mean, think about the handkerchief that Paul is sending out, healing people. We see her in Acts 5. Acts 5, uh, verse 12. says here, By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And on the 
of, of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. So this is, uh, we, we covered this chapter earlier on. Look, insomuch that they brought forth the sick onto the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. So even though there were supernatural things done by false prophets, it didn't match what Jesus did, what the apostles did when they were like in their prime of healing, just healing people completely. Remember when Jesus healed the blind man? And they said, well, I've never heard that somebody's been healed who's been blind from birth. You see, so it's, they still can't match the things that Jesus was doing um, and, and, and that God was doing. Let's look here at uh, Acts 8. Remember, Simon the sorcerer wanted that power that, was, that, the, that the apostles have to give the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So you see, there was always something different, something greater, than what God did, than what those who were false prophets did. We see this same scenario even back in Exodus, right? When, when Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, you had the magicians with their enchantments, and they could match it to a certain extent. But then it went beyond what they could do. Exodus 7 verse 8. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast out his rod before Pharaoh, and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Right? You say, well, that's a miracle, turning a stick into a snake. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. What? So they threw a stick down, and the stick became a serpent too. For they cast out every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod, look at this, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. So you can see here the snake you know, that was God's rod, right? It was more powerful than the other rods. So even though they tried, to mat they tried to mimic it, they couldn't match it, right? God's miracle was always greater. And then later on, we'll skip through, you know, the rest of them. But I want to show you here in Acts, uh, Exodus 8, 16. So then the next plague was turning the water into blood. And they turned some water into blood. And the next plague was the frogs. Remember, they brought frogs out of the land. They were even able to bring frogs out of the land. You see, well, they weren't, they weren't able to get rid of the frogs. Right? They weren't able to get rid of the blood. You know, like, so they, that's why they, they tried to mimic, but they couldn't match it. Right? But um, Moses got rid of the frogs. And then here you get to Acts 8, uh, Exodus 8, 16, where you get to the lice. Right? And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice. Look, so they tried but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. And look at this. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. So we see this same similar scenario happening in, in, in Ephesus in Acts 19, where you see these miracles done. They're trying to match them. They can't match them. And God's miracles is so much greater, right? And then we see here that, that God is getting glorified through that. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks, also dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, 
brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. See, so you don't add Jesus to your false religion. Right? You don't just add Jesus. You know, you believe, you believe something false and you're just going to add Jesus to this. No, it's Jesus and you turn away from false beliefs. You turn away, like it says in Thessalonians, from idols. Here, even more extremely, they brought all their books together and they burned them. I mean, think about this time. Like now when we burn books, it's like not that big a deal. Why? Because books are just mass produced. They're so cheap. You know, you can buy, you can buy a Bible for like $2, $1, you know, just the printed paperbacks. Back then, I mean, you know, people are handwriting these books on handmade parchments and all that sort of stuff. And they're burning their books. This is a lot of money that's being burnt up. Right? They're making a big stance here. Counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. You see there when people you know, are a bit more extreme in their following of Jesus, it says here, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. You know, sometimes I think Christians, they, they, they try and just mold and conform to the world. They don't want to stick out. They don't want to be too different. They don't want to change too much in their life. You know, they're comfortable where they are before. And, oh, you know, this Christian there is too different. I want to stick out. But you know what? If believers were like the people here in Ephesus and said, you know what? We're leaving the false culture behind. We're leaving the false beliefs behind. We don't care if we look different. We want to, be, we want to stand out and be a light for Jesus Christ. Maybe verse 20 would be the same for us. So mightily grew the word of God. Look at this. And prevailed. You know, it's like believers should be setting the culture. We shouldn't just be following the culture. Right? So don't just you know, conform to the world and think, like, oh, I'm worried like, what all my unbelieving friends are going to think. You know, why don't you be the light in that dark place, be the salt and light you're called to be, and maybe the word of God will grow mightily and prevail. So, what are we talking about here? Miracles. You know, you know, the world cannot match God. And maybe we don't have all the gifts of the Spirit today like we see in Acts Maybe miracles don't happen as much as they were happening in the early days. But we have God's word. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, the Bible is a superior text. The Savior Jesus is a superior religious figure. You know, know that. And, you know, go out with, with the boldness of, of the apostles. But if you don't know that, you don't know your Bible well, you don't know Jesus well, you're not going to go out with the boldness and, and take that stand like they did here, you know, burn, burn their past, you know, burn, burn their false culture and their false beliefs and move forward following the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't just try and add Jesus, you know, and just try and conform to the world. So we see here that huge victory, right? Books were extremely expensive at the time, not like today. Now let's look at this last bit. A couple of interesting things here. Demetrius, the silversmith. Demetrius, the silversmith, he's the, the, the key person here that's Trying to rouse up these people. You know, he's running a successful business, you know, building, making idols to, the, to Diana of the Ephesians. Right? Acts 19, 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Archaea to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I had been, I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And at the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. So there isn't without great works, great persecution. You know, and same is happening here in Ephesians. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. So, you know, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Here we go. The Bible's telling us here that the main motive of Demetrius was he didn't like Paul because now it was affecting his income. It was affecting their business. And they had made a lot of money selling these things in, you know, uh, in, in Ephesus, right? 
So it's like a lot of things in this world, you know, it's usually the businesses that keep promoting all these holidays and everything like that because they want you to buy their roses and their diamond rings and all these sorts of things. And here, it's like in, uh, in Mexico, you know, probably people made a lot of money making statues of Guadalupe, right? Because you go to every house, statue of Guadalupe, statue of Guadalupe, statue of Guadalupe. And so you can see that this happens even today. Back then, it's statues, you know, of Diana, you know, Diana of the Ephesians. They made a lot of money making these silver statues of Diana. Whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Right? So first he appeals to the money. Moreover, you see in here that not only alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So isn't that great that, you know, look at people that are fearing the work of one man. You know, see how one man can make a huge difference and, you know, that they're worried that the influence of this one person, saying that, there be, that they be no gods which are made with hand, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. So it's just interesting that, you know, you can see the, the order in which they're mentioning it is probably the order of their priority. It's taking away our money, right? And well, there's a moral implication too because it's affecting our religion. And her, uh, and her magnificent magnificence should be destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship it. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So a couple of points I just want to say here is just notice how Demetrius, who's like the key instigator here, how he like sort of rabbles up the crowd, right? how he moves this multitude. And I just feel like you can see the same tactics being employed today, right? Now, first of all, you don't want, you know, your priorities to be in the order of these pagan Gentile Ephesians here where their, their priorities are, well, it's affecting your wallet, then it's affecting your religion, and then it's affecting your wanting to be com in conformity with everyone else, right? So is that, is that your priorities? Are your priorities like that? Because it's unfortunate, because sometimes people, that, that you can see, based on the decisions in their life, what their priorities are. Is your priority first God, or is your priority first career and your money and your livelihood you want it to be god first not your livelihood so that's one thing i want to say second thing i want to say here is notice the the, the method and the tactic in which he rabbles up a crowd first it appeals to the money so they all start with him so you can remember first it appeals to the money second then it appeals to their morals right well here it's their religion right and third, it appeals to the masses. And the reason why I think this is interesting, because it's like those same tactics are employed today. Think about what happened with COVID, right? How did they, how did they get everyone on board with this whole COVID rubbish, you know, get, trying to get you vaccinated and get everyone? One is they affected your income. Either they fine you, they say you can't work, they get, they get all people on board. And then second, they say, oh, if you don't get vaccinated, you're a granny killer. You don't care. They, they, now it's the moral. They make you feel like you're, you're somebody that's just morally repugnant, right? Like here, everyone's a, you know, it's affecting our religion. And the last one is a magnificent, to all the world worship it. They're saying like, you're going against the grain, right? You're, you're the ones that are different. Oh, you're not wearing, you know, they make everyone wear a mask. So now it's like visible who's like going against the grain. You know, all the, the anti-maskers or whatever they called people that didn't wear masks. So those same tactics, I feel like, are employed today. It's just interesting here that those same three kind of aspects are used to move this multitude. They did it with COVID. I'm sure they're going to they try to do it with the voice as well. You know, you know all, the, all the corporations. Maybe, maybe you can't now get a job with any large corporations until you agree to all their diversity and gender and all their you know, transgender agendas and everything like that. 
and, and next is probably going to be the climate stuff too. You know, they're just making everyone, you know, you're, you just want to kill everyone in five years. You know, and they keep saying the same like thing over and over again. So I just see the same tactics being employed even here to rabble this crowd up. Now let's go on. Acts 19, 29. It says, And the whole city was filled with confusion. Having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theatre. So there's this, you know, there's this big you know, uproar happening. People are going in. When Paul would have entered in unto the people, because remember, they were angry at Paul, right? So they knew there was Paul they were after. The disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theatre. One point I just want to bring out from these three verses is you see here an example of Paul's boldness. That he knew that he was who they were after. And yet, it's almost like without even thinking, he's going to go face them. <laughs> and, his, and his friends are like, whoa, 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 like they're holding him back, you know? So I just think it's, it's a great example here from Paul of his boldness and his, 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 his willingness to just face that opposing crowd and face that opposition. And uh, would to God we would have that same boldness um, uh, that he had. Let's go on. <coughs> So, certain of the chief, eight, yeah, um, 32, Acts 19, 32. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. So, what I thought was interesting here in verse 32 is it says here, some of the people that were angry, it says here, for the assembly was confused and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. So the majority of the people there that were angry didn't even know why they were there. So, it's like again, you see this today. When people are riled up and they get angry and they're opposing one another on social media, that not everyone even knows the facts. They don't even know everything that's going on. They don't even know the truth. And it's the same here. They come, they're all angry, right? They're like, well, what are we even angry at? Well, what's, what's the actual the, the story here, right? So people get drawn into taking sides <laughs> and they don't even understand all the facts. Um, you know, I feel that was similar to the, the Ukraine situation, you know, with Ukraine and Russia. And I feel like, you know, Australia shouldn't even be involved in these, you know, foreign entanglements. But how, how passionate were people you know, going with Ukraine, and then people are getting with Russia. And some people are like, you know, they, they don't even know all the facts about what, do we even know all the facts about what's going on over there? You know, do we really believe that the media is giving us the true story? So, but people get so angry about what's going on, and, and we don't even know if we have all the facts. Acts 19, let's continue, verse 33. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. Right? So, they, so Paul is refrained from facing them. They take out, like they remember they took out Jason, you know, like he got persecuted in the previous chapter of Acts. Here they're taking out Alexander. Alexander is now going to try and deal with them, beckoned with the hand, would have made his defense unto the people. And when they knew he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana! Of the Ephesians. So he doesn't let them address the crowd. It's similar to like what happens today. You know, maybe an angry protest mob will just shout over the person so they're not able to speak. This is what is happening here. Now, this is where I just want to say, say some things about Alexander because I was reading some things up about Alexander. A lot of people believe that this Alexander in Acts 19 is the Alexander that Paul refers to in his epistles. Remember Alexander, we'll go to there, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Now, if this is the same Alexander, which a lot of people think it is, this is just a very sad story. I mean, we had Demas. Remember how Paul talks about Demas? Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You had Titus left to Galatia. So Titus, I don't know, at one point forsook him. I don't know if he came back, but, you know, there was a letter to Titus. So 
for these closest people of Paul, we have Alexander here, who was like Jason, being persecuted with Paul. You know, he was a, a Gentile convert, so he's a proselyte. He's obviously a professing believer. He's now like willing to face a crowd to talk about his beliefs. And yet at some point, he went shipwreck. He went apostate. And Paul disciplined him. It says here, 1 Timothy 1, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So you see how he didn't hold fast to the end. He fell off the bandwagon. You know, that doesn't mean he lost his salvation, but obviously he, he, he didn't go down the right path in his faith, right? Like a lot of people do. Not everyone finishes their course with joy, like Paul says. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So is it, to, is it necessarily that Alexander was just like, because just saying blasphemous things against Jesus Christ? Or maybe it was the way they were living. Because, you know, I, I, I'm just bringing this off the top of my head, but um, I know there's that verse that talks about, you know, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, it's referring to the to, to way ladies behave themselves. So here, it's saying here that they may learn not to blaspheme. Maybe it's that they just started living very ungodly. You know, there are certain things that get you kicked out of a church. And when he says, I've delivered them unto Satan, they fell under church discipline and were excommunicated. But then we see in 2 Timothy 4, it says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil, the Lord reward him according to his works, of whom thou be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. So something that's sort of, you know, something to reflect on with Alexander, if indeed this is the same Alexander, is that it's unfortunate that sometimes you have people start well, they don't end well, they get disciplined, you know, by church leadership. It doesn't look like they respond well to that to that discipline, right, of maybe getting excommunicated. Different to the guy in 1 Corinthians, right? In 1 Corinthians 5, you remember there was the Corinthian fornicator, where it says here, reported commonly among you, there's fornication among you. I'll just try and skip through this for sake of time. You are puffed up and have not rather more that he hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So they excommunicated this fornicator in the Corinthian church, but he, he got right. You know, he repented. He came back and... Here, he repented of that sin and he says, hey, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was afflicted of many. So that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up over much sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. But it seems like with Alexander, it says here, Alexander the Covenant did me much evil, the Lord reward him according to his works. So not everyone has the right response when they're disciplined. You know, if, like, if you come under discipline, or even like, you know, you are told that you're doing something wrong, and I've, I've sort of experienced this in my life. Sometimes people, they have the right frame of mind. It's like, yeah, they admit they're wrong, and they just, you know, confess it and forsake it. But others, instead of being penitent, instead of being humble, they get vengeful, right? They're like, how dare you? Who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you? Well, it's, well, church leader you know you're there to to rule in the house of god that that's your, your view so it seems like alexander the coppersmith went the other way right and became vengeful to the point where it became an ongoing problem with paul even later on in his ministry so he had the incorrect response to discipline he became vengeful rather than penitent like the corinthian fornicator so if you come under discipline, you don't want to be like Alexander the Coppersmith. You want to be like the Corinthian fornicator. Obviously, not, don't, don't do the, the problem to begin with, but the response. All right, let's just get, finish this off. Acts 19.35, And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not? How the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter. So I think the town clerk here, being the politician that he is, is just now just 
appeasing both sides, right? And he's saying like, look, you know, acknowledge you guys, not, not just an image, you know, she fell down from Jupiter. You know, you guys, we know that this city believes, believes this. Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, she ought to be quiet to do nothing rashly. So the town clerk is just trying to sort of calm the crowd, right? And get them to do things lawfully. Like he says, hey, we could, they actually did something wrong. It needs to be a lawful assembly and go through the process. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Now, this is one of the last points I want to make here is, notice that the town clerk, when he, when he describes Paul and his following, that he says, hey, they're neither robbers of churches, so they're not, they can't be accused of doing anything uh, bad. But he says here, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Now, so that tells me that when Paul went to Ephesus preaching the gospel, he was doing it in a way that obviously was not intentionally, you know, just out there trying to offend and saying, you bunch of pagans, you know, defiling their temple, you know, kicking out their statues, you know, just like that sort of attitude, which unfortunately a lot of Christians have today when they deal with false religions. They just like, in that, that sort of aggressiveness, I don't think that's how Paul was. I think he showed that he preached them the truth. I don't think there was any question that he was against the idolatry of the Ephesians. But isn't it, isn't it interesting that when the town clerk, the public official there, you know, sort of identifies them, he's saying, well, they're not robbers of church, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. And so they were known more about preaching the Lord Jesus than they were against, you know, maybe the things they were saying against Diana of the Ephesians, right? So that just reminds me of just, you know, the, the Bible, how it tries to encourage us to communicate with people. First Peter 3.15 But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So you say we want to be ready there with an answer, but what's, what's our attitude? What's our spirit like when we talk to people? It's, it's humble, meekness, and fear. Colossians 4, 6, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. So if you think about your food as, your speech as food, you don't just dump, you know, you, you don't just dump like this whole bowl of salt onto your food. You know, you sprinkle your food with a bit of salt to make it taste good. That's how your speech should be. So when we go out and try and preach the gospel, you need to think that's the way it should be. Sometimes new believers get a bit zealous, you know? They're so keen to tell them they're a bunch of, you know, pagan idol worshippers, are oh, your pagan practices, you know, you speak to a Muslim, you know, oh, you know, you're following a pedophile. Well, you know, maybe that's true, but is that the first thing you're going to, is that the thing you're going to lead with, you know, when you're talking with a Muslim? You're not going to lead that, you know? That's, that's probably going to be the natural thing that comes up when you start talking about things that the, these different people did. So I wanted to bring that point out there because I just see that, with, especially with new believers, that you know, you're zealous, you're passionate, you, you know the truth, you want people to know the truth. Sometimes you get a bit, a bit impatient because you know, you've had a lot of time to learn these things and research these things and you are trying to give this person that you're talking to you know, the information of like three years into like a five minute time span. So you know, you, you don't always are as tactful as you should be, like it says here in Colossians 4, 6. But we need to remember that. And I think we can see that the example from Paul as well is like that too. Let's finish. Acts 19, 30. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them in plead one another. But if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. But we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. So the town clerk there was able to um, appease the crowd. And I just think it's interesting, his testimony of how he describes Paul and his followers, not robbers of churches and nor blasphemers of the goddess of Diana, even though they were very, very effective in Ephesus. Okay, so in conclusion, let's just recap. 
some of the lessons. So first lesson is, you know, don't get mixed up with the wrong understanding of repentance in regards to salvation. Okay, so repentance of sin is one thing, something we do as believers. Repentance to salvation is repentance from dead works. Trusting Jesus Christ, it's not turning from sin. Because if you have to turn from sin to be saved, that's a false gospel. That's work salvation. Number two, true baptism is believer's baptism. So if you're baptized as a child, you're baptized as an unbeliever, that's not baptism, right? And we see there in Acts 19, unbelievers who were following Jesus, but when they got saved, they got baptized after they believed. Number three, beware of signs and wonders that take you away from the truths of God's word, right? So signs and wonders can be done by false prophets, so make sure you trust God's word first, okay? Judge the prophet by God's word and the, the miracles are secondary. Number four is don't just add Jesus to your false religion, right? So you have to, you can't be like just the sons of Sceva, you can't just add Jesus, you need to trust Jesus completely. Number five, don't be drawn into two sides of an argument if you're ignorant of the facts. Remember a lot of the Ephesians were there, didn't even know what was going on. For the most part, the majority didn't know what was going on. Number six, be humble in correction. So just be wary of the attitude of Alexander the coppersmith. You know, he started well, didn't end well, and then when he was corrected, made it worse. All right, so be humble in correction. And number seven, we make sure we preach the gospel with meekness, fear, and grace. Because even though Paul was being very effective, you know, it seems there that the public testimony of Paul and his followers were, was a message of Jesus, love, even though I think, I, I, I would sure, they made it very clear that they were against idolatry, right? So I hope you learned something there today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the book of Acts. Lord, we just thank you for the stories, how they can encourage us, they can teach us, Lord, help us, as we reflected on today, have the right priorities. Help us to have meekness, fear, and grace with how we deal with one another. But help us to also be bold. You know? And Lord, I, 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 I trust that if we were like the Gentiles in, Ephes in, in Ephesus, that made that bold stand, burn all their books, Lord. Do not care for conformity, that the word of God would grow mightily and would prevail. So we pray you help us, Lord. Help us to have that boldness. Help us to have your power. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.